Good afternoon, everyone. This is Allison Grace. I am the managing editor of Intellectual Inc. Magazine. So today, I have an amazing interview happening, and it is with Kathy Iandoli, the author of Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah. So I wanted to hop in really quick and let you guys know exactly who I am. Uh, before she comes in. So we're just sitting here waiting. I'm so excited to bring this to you. Um, This will be on our podcast uh, on Ink Mag TV. (laughs) So it'll be on Grace on the Fire and it will be on our YouTube. So I'm very, very excited to bring this to you today. So now we just wait. All right. Well, welcome, Kathy. It's good to see you today on this brisk Saturday. Thank you so much. So how have you been? Can't complain. I mean, it is it is brisk. It's it's where uh we're we're in the in-between, right? Like yeah. I feel like fall fall's like gonna go from summer to winter. I don't think there's a fall right now. I totally agree. What's your favorite season? Fall. Which really? is yeah, so we're going to get robbed of it. So, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to get, you know, second place is spring. So fingers crossed we get one of those. <laughs> yeah. I tend to hold on to my summer clothes as much as possible because mm-hmm. I'm a summer baby. So I love, love, love mm-hmm. when it's warm. But the one thing I love about the fall and winter is that I can sit in my little nook and I can write. Yes. Yes. It's 100%. perfect writing weather. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Yeah, so let's dive right in. Um, I am totally enamored. I've read this three oh. times already. Three times. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I, I I didn't want it to end, so I have to keep on reading it over and over. And for those that haven't seen it, this is Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah. And this is, wow, this is an amazing, amazing journey because me personally, as someone that is old enough to remember her, Mm -hmm. um, I remember when she was smaller, when she was younger and on on Star Search. Oh, wow. Yes. Right. So um, I'm 45. Mm -hmm. So I remember seeing her and I was like, wow, she's so pretty. Wow, she can sing. And I've just watched her grow up. Um, Did you feel the same writing this? Absolutely, because I'm Alia's age. So when when I was writing the book, it was like, it was starting during, like remembering the fandom, you know, that brought me there, which was in 1994 with the back and forth video. So I, I literally ventured into my, my like fandom for Aaliyah. Like it was like, it was traveling through that journey. And then obviously how that fandom evolved after she passed away, like how the, the next 20 years were spent still being an Aliyah fan because the thing was every January and every August I would still commemorate Aliyah like on my socials and, and things like that and even before social media I would think of her on on those um on those important dates because you never you when you're when you're a fan of an artist like they never leave you right but for someone like Aliyah who brought a different kind of magic when I was writing this book, it was one of those situations where I, I carried those moments with me. Like it was, I went over them again. And I remembered the moments of just moments that involved her that shaped me as a person. Okay. So let's take it back a little bit. Let's, let's, let's find out the history Mm-hmm. way before this book because this book is pivotal to hip-hop history and um yeah it's it's really really something it's it's you put you can put literally a a push pin in it in my opinion and and you can go back to it and say hey this is what came out in 2021 but let's take it back um so you were a writer with vibe and double xl what caused you to venture into specifically um I would say hip hop culture. 
Well, my relationship with hip hop culture, you know, predates obviously my writing. I'm any, I'm a, I'm a seventies born eighties baby, I guess. Hey. Could, yeah. Right? <laughs> so I'm like within a couple of years of the age of hip hop, right? Like I'm like, I was born when hip hop was like just a couple of years old. Right. So I became, I, I was a baby of hip hop. Like I was a child of hip hop. So it was something that was going to find me no matter how I, no matter what, right? And that journey probably started in one of the, you know, most important years in hip hop, 1989. Mm. You know, I was 10 years old. And I just remember it, it, it spoke to me. It spoke to me. And being a kid who went to school in the inner city and went home to the suburbs, right? I had this kind of, um, I don't want to even call it a balance. It was more like just live, I lived in two different worlds every right. day of my life, right? So my mother was a teacher in the inner city of Patterson and that's where my family is from. So I went to school there and then I would go home to the burbs. So I had two separate fr- uh, sets of friends. I learned about two separate things because at that age at 10 years old, you know, even just being a kid in general, you know, like half of my life was spent thinking about new kids on the block. The other half was spent thinking about Queen Latifah, Moni Love and Ladies First, right? Like that kind of, that kind of situation. So the obvious winners, were Queen Lasifa, Moni Love, like hip hop in general. And then like by 92, when TLC came out, it was like game over. Oh my God, yes. I think it was because of the strong identities that these women had, right? And how committed they were to maintaining those identities. Because when you think about what pop music was in the 80s and 90s, it was very cookie cutter. There was too much to lose by being individual. It was, it was, it was a, a booming business. So if you didn't have the ripped jeans and the blue eyeshadow and singing about boys in your bedroom, there was you weren't gonna make the money, you weren't going to be famous, right? With hip hop, there was a lot more risk involved because at that point for its place in music, which gave um, an opportunity to the artist to have these more defined personalities, you know? And that, and it was a, a, a culture and a movement that was like 10, 11 years old at best, right? Like, so, but it was a combination of all the black music that predated it, right? So you're talking about such an intense culture. Pop culture is, is generic by design. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dumping ground of all other cultures, right? That kind of like fall into this mainstream. So I was drawn to the identities in hip hop mm. and it inspired me to be an individual and to go against the grain and to speak up and to rebel. And being a woman, it spoke to me differently because people would always kind of say to me like, you're a journalist and, you know, hip hop and, you know, there's a lot of misogyny. It's like, there's misogyny everywhere. So what are you saying? But as a woman who is trying to walk this path or even a young girl becoming a woman, right? When you see all of these other women who have these like very like strong personalities it inspires you to be a strong, you know, individual as well. So it was something that consistently shaped me. And by the time it came to like figuring out what I wanted to do with my life, it was really just trying to tell the stories of all of these people who inspired me. So. Oh man, that's wow. Um, so you mentioned you 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 said something that that stuck out to me just now. Mm-hmm. You said going against the grain, right? Mm-hmm. Now, um, as far as I know, let me. I just I want to clarify this um, this book, this novel is unauthorized by the family. Yes. Okay. What was the deciding factor knowing that it was unauthorized Mm -hmm. made you want to go against the grain? Hmm. Well, the first, 
just to be clear, the first people I reached out to were the family. Okay. So this wasn't a situation where um, I didn't ask for participation. I did. And they right. don't want to participate. And I understand that, that I respect their, I respect their wishes. Um, the story still needs to be told. You're, we're the same, we're in the same age bracket. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the conversations that were happening, you know, you know what, you know, the way that the story was being told continuously, all different aspects of it. We're not just talking about that, that, that guy who just mm -hmm. got sentenced or well, not sentenced yet, but we're not talking about just him. There's, there's a conversation that was surrounding Aliyah over the years that in many ways needed to be put to rest. There were flowers that were not being given to her that had to be given. And that for me was a bigger mission than having that participation or even approval to do so. Because if it's, if it, if you're writing it from the perspective of someone who, who wants to still adore her, Aaliyah, and tell the story, you know, this wasn't a book where I was trying to expose her or there was nothing to expose, you know, like the, the it's the environmental factors that needs to be exposed, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't all about herself, Aaliyah was yes, yes. So this wasn't a situation where I needed permission to drag her because that's what, I was never gonna do that, right? That was never going to be the case. Even if people see the truth as something negative because it, 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 it makes people uncomfortable. It makes people uncomfortable to know that she did survive something. She didn't survive the plane crash, but she survived something else, mm, right? And, that, and that, makes, that makes people uncomfortable. And, mm -hmm. and, and I understand that doesn't take away from the fact that the story had to be told because I'm a firm believer that now after reading my book and after what has been now um, coincides with the, with the court's decisions and the things that were brought to light that were under oath, you will never again say that Aliyah was the wife of R. Kelly. You will never again say that Aliyah wasn't a songwriter. You will never again say that Aliyah wasn't a visionary. And you will never again say that Aliyah wasn't a genius. But most of all, you will never again say that she wasn't a survivor. Oh my God. Ooh. So not that, and if that's going against the grain, then that's where we're headed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? So that was for me my mission. That, you know, um, good, bad, or indifferent, no matter what um, people might think of that, my mission stayed intact. And my mission was accomplished. And the people who do give the book a chance are confirm that it was the right thing to do. That's, that's, that's amazing. Um, and that goes in line with my next question because um, I was having a conversation. I was telling someone while I was reading it, they were like, well, what's that book about? And I was like, oh, that's about Aaliyah, you know, basically about her life. And they were like, oh, so that means they're talking about him. And I was like, well... Right. Yes and no. Right. Um, it's the focus is about Aaliyah. However, you cannot, you absolutely cannot not mention him simply because in a way, both go hand in hand. However, right. one can be removed from the other. You know what I'm saying? So um, when I explained that to them, they were like, okay, I'll give it a chance. And they, she came back to me. She told me she loved it. Oh, good, good. That makes me happy. Yes, me too. Because I, I, I tried to sell it to her and not necessarily sell it to her, but just mm -hmm. let her know that this is something that, you know, you, you, you are aware of it, but you don't know the full details. And right. you, you, while you can't, you, you don't want to because of what's going on. You don't want to, you know, to, 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 to tangle up her name in that, Absolutely. but you would be remiss to not mention him because he has not necessarily a foundation, but mm -hmm. he definitely has a backstory to where she was and has come within her career. You understand? Yeah. And, and you can't, 
I originally I sold the book saying that I was only going to cover Aliyah's life from 96 to 2001. Oh my God. That's how I sold the book because there was, there was a couple of reasons. I was still grappling with whether or not I was going to include 94 to 95 for 94 to 96. Mm -hmm. And also if I chose to do it, I wanted it to, I wanted to know I did it for free. Mm. Because the, my book advance was not dictated by whether or not I was going to bring up that time period. Mm -hmm you know, and there was a lot of, a lot of publishers that had a problem with that. And we're trying to, you know, sweeten the deal, as they say, um, if I guaranteed that discussion. And I, I, I didn't, right. Because I, I didn't want, that's not the, that's not the kind of book I was trying to write anyway, which is it's still not the book that I ended up writing. But when you think about the impact that he had even following, right? Like you can't, if you erase him from the story, then you don't, then you erase the source of Ali of strength, right? In surviving that disgusting world that he met at such a young age. But then on top of all that, you create this pretty picture where one in a million starts and we don't talk about how Alia was booed on stage at 15, 16 years old after she left him. Um, you don't talk about how Alia couldn't find producers that wanted to work with her. You, and you take away from the impact and the importance of her relationship with Missy and Timbaland at that point. Because Missy and Timbaland also came from a very traumatic experience with the swing mob. Yeah, and, yeah. and when you talk about that sense of community of people who left very destructive situations and found each other, that sense of community makes that second half or, or half, not, I mean, it's not the order uh, of, of one in a million, but that, that half of it that has Missy and Timberland on it, you take away from the fact that this was a community that found each other, right? based upon traumatic experiences. You can't just say that she glided right into her second project. There, was, there were times where she wasn't sure she was going to make it, that she wasn't going to be Alia after AJ Nothing But A Number. So if you, and, and you have to ask why, and it was because this music industry is based upon this patriar these patriarchal values that even if your patriarch is an abuser, who should have been in prison a long time ago, they'll still ride for him and they'll still stigmatize his victim and make it seem like, well, if we work with her, will he not work with us? You know, the bag was still at stake and people were very reluctant to work with Aliyah, who was the draw. She was the star of the show. He's out here dressing her just like him, singing his songs in her voice, right? So, the idea that he made her is also false because he was out of the picture within that, that time frame. So if you don't mention all of that stuff, you make it look like she walked into paradise and that's not what happened. Nope. So, you know, and it also just, it, it, another thing that it just makes people uncomfortable because you're not just attacking him, you're attacking the system around him and the business around him and her. So it's, 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 an, it's an uncomfortable conversation, but it should hold a mirror to the music industry and where they have to think twice before they let their 13 year old R&B singer hole up in a studio with a 26 year old man, right? Like these are things you have to think about, but it's only, you only can think about them if you show them for what they are. Mm. You know, if you treat it like two people, one, one teenager who was super mature, one 20 uh, something who was immature and they just found each other, you will never learn the lesson. No, you have to say it was a predator who preyed upon this person, made her think of what this situation, that it, was, uh, that it was something else when it was really just destructive, how she escaped that and became an icon who even 20 years after her death is setting the tone for the entire music industry. Mm. You, can't, you can't tell that story without him. Like you, you, need, you need that piece because it only makes it more impactful that in her, abs her physical absence, Aaliyah is still killing it. Her, mm -hmm. her albums were number one and two on iTunes, uh, yeah. like Friday. Like yes. who, for someone who has been gone for 20 years, who can say that a reissue could have that kind of an impact cross-generational, you know?
the, the, I don't, I can't think of a single artist. Oh, wow. I can't either. I can't. That's so, a really yeah. good point. That, um, that actually leads me into my next question. So, um, Aliyah, God bless her, has been gone for 20 years, right? Just for argument's sake, do you think that there would be a change in the music industry now had she be, been alive? Absolutely. Do you think that there would be a Beyonce? <laughs> That's the common well, question. There, would have been a, there's, there, there was a Beyonce while Aliyah was here. Beyonce would still be Beyonce. Um, I, I mean, I think the thing that I think about Aliyah in, in terms of her career. I'm, it's, I, it's, never, it's never in my nature to pit her against other women or any woman against mm -hmm, her. Of course, you're right. Um, because that's like saying, if Kurt Cobain were here, would we still have, you know, so-and-so? Like, would, right, would, right. Would that, would that, because nobody says those things, Fair right? Enough. If Biggie were here, would we still have a Jay-Z? Yeah. Mm, yeah. You know, <laughs> we have Kendrick Lamar. Of course we would. Like, that's not, that's not the case. Um, with Aaliyah, if Aaliyah were here, I think that the artists who have been inspired by her, but didn't necessarily have to credit her, mm. the, the direction of their music might be different, mm. right? It's, it's an entirely different set of circumstances when you can't readily access music. And you think about it like this, right? Let's say you have like a top designer who was like really big in the nineties and two thousands and the designer went out of business and you can only find their shirts at like thrift shops. Right. So if I go to a thrift shop and I find that one shirt and I make my entire clothing line out of that shirt, that, that insp inspiration behind that shirt and I get a deal and you see my stuff in, in Macy's and Nordstrom and even Urban Outfitters. Everyone's going to be like, wow, you're so prolific. That's an amazing design. How did you think about it? Well, it was designed, it was inspired by so many different threads, whatever, whatever. Now what happens when that clothing designer goes back into the stock and you're now sharing hangers with them? And you find out that, that that clothing line had been out since the 90s, but only went out of business temporarily. You, and you look at it and it's like, well, wait a minute. That looks just like your shirt. That's what's happening right now with Aliyah. Yeah. You're going on iTunes and you're like, hold the phone. Hearing fell out. Hold the phone. I'm, I'm here hearing you. You've just been out for the last five years. You sound like her who released that in 96. Time, time to, time to, to, to credit the, the source. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what that would have looked like. Would there be that side-by-side -side comparison to newer artists? Would those newer artists have been inspired or would they have had to? Would, would Aliyah have started her own record label, her own imprint, would she have signed artists herself? Um, because she was gonna do a, a fashion line and an accessory line and because she was headed into Hollywood and doing all these things, I don't doubt that she would have had a makeup line. Like I think she would have had similarly these well-rounded careers that Beyonce and Rihanna have, right? where you have there's like multi-dimensional i agree uh okay. Aliyah would also be a billionaire like i think yeah. she you know she would have definitely been in that club so i think she would have been she wouldn't have been just a traditional singer i think she would have been doing what these artists are doing like and because Aliyah and beyonce were cool like imagine Aliyah being a model in ivy park oh man like, that would like, be great if you think about things because like Ivy Park like feels like it's like, you know, that kind of that same sporty, sexy. Yeah, it's like Tommy uh, Hilfiger. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine if um if if that, that opportunity were to happen, if like, you know, or if Aliyah had her own line and Beyonce modeled and like the two of them, like I would, I I would, I didn't, I wouldn't, you know, everybody kind of like thinks that they would have been at war. I think that they would have just been the like coolest duo. Absolutely. You know? I totally think that they would. They would kind of be like, you know how um, I would kind of think like maybe like Cardi B and how Beyonce, they kind of like collaborate on things or even Cardi and, and Meg, they collaborate on things. I don't think that it would be um, more so like competitive this way. They would like literally ride each other and, and compliment each other. Um, and that's what I like about 
the way how the music industry is right now. I don't think mm-hmm. that there's a lot of competition happening. And if there is, I personally haven't seen it. Right. Um, I know that there was, um, who was it? I think it was SZA um, that has some sort of Twitter beef with uh, Chloe, Chloe Bailey. Really? I didn't yeah. know. So what happened was, um, I think there was a tweet that went out and Chloe um, said something and they were like, oh, well, she's copying off of her. Um, oh, it was uh, an album cover or a single or something. She uh-huh. feels the same way. And, um, and they were like, oh, no, no, that's, that's all love. You know, she responded and she was like, no, that's all love. You're like, I love her. Like, I love her music. So, you know, it's not a big deal. And you know, this is, this is what happens when the industry and society, they, they, they're used to the war. They love the drama and they love the, 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 the stuff that goes with it. And honestly, they're the ones we per se is, is, is we're the, we're the cause behind the, the, the rivalry between East coast and the West coast. Mm. And that was the beef and the drama because, um, you know, the, the drama between Big and Pac, it, it, it happens, but the media and, and, and everyone else hyped it up. And right. we didn't even have social media like that. So I can only imagine what would have happened. But they hyped it up to the point where it was just like, he said this and he said that and that, that, that. And it was, it, it just, unfortunately, it was a bad result. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't think that it would have been hyped up to the extent that it was had other people outside forces not have joined in and put the bug in each other's ear so yeah I mean the east coast west coast war was like something that I think should have never happened um because of the two main casualties that that um that we lost like in that process but I think it was it was one of those situations where it got so intense that there was like no way to put a lid on it at that point. Yes. And put it really back. It was impossible. And the, you know, you, you think about that now and, and you think about how young Biggie and Pac were. Yeah. And it's just, it's wild to think about. And it became like the, the, the biggest cautionary tale in hip hop. Um, but it also like it also changed the direction of rap music for years yes actually like i don't know and i use the word recovered loosely but i don't know if the sound of hip-hop ever recovered from that moment because after biggie died specifically because pop came first and then it was like you had to put the safety back on yes right so then it, it became like let's let's make it a party you know let's 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 do that and 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 that 97 to 99 time period is so important because it shows that dramatic split yeah had the shiny suit era mainstream and then underground you had like raucous records right so you had this like very strict division and then obviously you know even in the midst of like the 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 rap that you know spoke about you know selling drugs and it was still rooted in success it was still rooted in 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 money and up yes. in the tax bracket right um so i don't know i i wonder what would hip hop have looked like now if Pac and biggie were around oh you my know? gosh i feel like you're reading my mind because that was that was kind of like one of my next questions i promise you oh my gosh that's that's crazy. I don't know. Um, I don't know how it would be if if he was alive. I kind of feel like there would be a lot of work with Jay Z. Both of them, you know, work together, taking over Brooklyn. Um, but it's it's. And I, I think that the sound right now mm-hmm. is is very southern as far as the music is concerned. And I say that because of the Migos and the future and and the baby, you know, they have this, this, this way of rapping where it's kind of like, it's very Southern based in my mm-hmm. opinion. Mm-hmm. So they're bringing it up North now. Right. Because it's popular. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it's with selling. Um, but also I, what I will say is that, you know, rest in peace, pop smoke. Uh, he's also one of them that is kind of like, they're bringing the underground and the local guys to the forefront because right. it's kind of like, you don't know what can happen. You don't know mm-hmm. what's next. They have so much potential. So let's let them, let's give them the flowers now, yeah. you know, and you know, they're working harder. They're getting more recognition and mm-hmm. they're propelling forward. And I appreciate that right now about the industry because mm-hmm. it only takes one. It only takes one chance in order for you to be a success. 100%. You have to be in the right place at the right time, meet the right people, mm-hmm. um, and definitely have some talent. And if you have that talent and, you know, the stars are aligning, then it'll work for you. Right, right. So um, right. I'm, I'm seeing that that's happening now lately. Mm-hmm. So, um, wow. So I, I, I've noticed that you kind of have a theme with your books. Um, do you consider yourself a feminist? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Nice. I like that. Um, Do you think that now with the recognition that's being given to um, not only Black and brown women, but women as a whole, do you think that it is long overdue or do you think that it's trendy? It's a really good question. Um, Ask me in five years. (laughs) I'll hold you to that. I think that that's, I've said this about specifically women in hip hop where I was asked, you know, isn't it like, isn't it wonderful that women in hip hop are finally getting the recognition? And I'm like, as long as it's not considered a subgenre that's hot Mm. right now, like, remember we had mumble rap, we had drill, now we have women. Like, as long as it's not that, as long as it's understanding that women are not like, a subsector of hip hop there that, that's not what that's not what that is right like that that um like it's not it's not a collection of women right that that are that, that it's like okay that's this, it's not a genre it's not a subgenre right um as far as just like i mean women in general we're we're still getting paid less you know um the truth the true definition of a feminist is is wanting equality it's not wanting more Mm -hmm. not wanting less and we are seeing hints of that we're seeing glimpses of that equality right but we're not there right and you have to keep the momentum like uh, uh, like it's it's understanding that the recognition that's being given like especially to black women and women of color like being recognized and being placed in positions that they deserve to be in because like the there there were you know barriers to entry for so many years right these are positions that were well deserved and well earned and are ba- are rooted in the expertise and the you know intelligence and experience that 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 are required to fill those positions these aren't participation trophies so I think like, as long as, as long as the powers that be understand that you can't take two years and just give as many opportunities as possible and then have it bottom out and go right back to the old way. Like, as long as it's, it's, it's understanding that this is not just like to make you feel good and to, um, you being the, the or company, not the, not the person, um, that they're, that they're hiring. If it, like this, this isn't, these aren't, these aren't checkpoints on your press release. This is correcting history. This is correcting all of the wrongs that you've done and you have to keep that momentum going. Right. Um, so I don't really know. I don't, and you know, we need to get past the firsts. Right. We need to get past the the first woman of color to ever be on here or the first woman to ever do this. Once we get past the first, I want to see where the second, third, fourths and fifths are, because it's really cute to to make the big billboard about the first. But what happens with all the ones that follow? Mm. And are you going to pit? Are you going to pit the first with the second to see who can fight for the number one spot? Like that's the that's the thing. You know, what do we do when the greatest MC in hip hop is a woman? How is mm. hip hop gonna respond? Okay, okay. You know, what do you, you're like, you're not the female goat, you're the goat, 
Like yes, what happens yes. when that happens? What happens when the wealthiest person in hip hop is a woman? It's coming, right? What do you, what, what is hip hop going to do then? You know? So that's what I mean by ask me in five years, because right now it's, 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 it's this, um, we're in a very transitional period. Yes. You know, where we're actively pointing out the problems. I mean, you're watching organizations, at least I hope in, in sincerity to fix them. But what happens after that, you know? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, let me ask you something kind of lighthearted. Um, would you do reality TV? And if so, what kind would you do? Like, would you see yourself on um, maybe a docu-series speaking about hip hop culture or, you know, um, kind of like a love and hip hop type of thing? Like a star of like, like being like a character on the show? Yes. No, I'm not that interesting. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. That's that's a docu series, of course. I, I'm in I'm in several of them already, but on, on like a reality show where they have to like follow me around. Yeah, they're just gonna be following me around my house, like drinking tea and <laughs> like and writing, right? And and you know, dancing around my house to the Alia <laughs> on streaming. Finally, like they're not gonna, they're not. There, there's nothing like an interesting about what I do all day. No. <laughs> like I like, but uh, like, I always wonder like if certain reality TV characters who just really, um, or personalities rather want to, want to be in that space. Like, do they have to start like making up stuff that they do all day? Like, do I have to like start doing a thing that makes me interesting? Because like, really there's nothing. It's just me hanging out with my dog. Like there's not like, I would that I would be the worst character on reality TV. Like they would be like, what? Who cares? Like, like that. I would have to just like I would just be the prop. Like where while something's going on, I would just be like, mm hmm. I told you. <laughs> that would just be me. Just that person. Uh huh. Oh my god! I swear! I swear! It's like with Kendra's spirits. <laughs> I've literally said the same thing. Someone asked me, they were like, what would you do if you were on reality TV? Like, your life is so interesting. You're a writer. And I'm like, it's really not. Like, I wouldn't have you, they wouldn't have to give me any money for wardrobe. Just buy me pajamas, you know? Exactly. <laughs> it would literally be me and my sweatpants on Zoom. Yes. What is like, wow. Like, now that you just like put that in my head, like what a sad series. <laughs> they were just following me around. I don't know how people do it on like Big Brother. It's like, you know, and I think that they they do that and they 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 tape it constantly. So it's right. like a camera that's always mm -hmm. showing you, except for of course when you go to the bathroom and stuff, unless mm -hmm. they're doing something really shady in the bathroom. But it's like you're being watched constantly 24-7 in Big Brother. And like nothing's happening. Like, what are you doing? Whole camera team will be asleep. Yes. Whole and that's why it's scripted. Reality TV yeah. is 75% scripted and they place you in situations where, you know, it's like, you're, oh, they find your kid's father. Um, they know that you guys are having a tumultuous relationship. I'm going to go get something to eat. And he ends up being there, you know, just by chance. No, they that would never happen there. to me. I order DoorDash. <laughs> never happen. Unless, unless he's my DoorDash driver. <laughs> never never going to find him there. But I like, love that. Or like when, when somebody's like, oh, you know, they were talking about you. I would be like, so? Yeah. Like, I'd be like, good for them. <laughs> okay. My next question. What um, projects I, I know, but I, I want you to say it. What projects do you have happening very, very soon? Well, the one, well, there's two. I'm trying to do this like really dramatic reveal, but one of them is not here. Um, the one I have coming is um, the Hip Hop Queen's Oracle deck. Oh! And, um, you know, it's it's inspired by God um, with uh, women in hip hop and R&B. I love that. And um, it was uh, illustrated by the incredible Monica Ahana New. Nice. And there's some just amazing it's it's i'm i'm so excited for this project because i wrote the guidebook and then all of the inspirations are you know pulled from um the attributes of the women in the deck so i have that 
coming up on November 23rd. Prior to that, the beginning of November, you know, my book with T Pain, Can I Mix You a Drink? It's coming out. I, I curated um, the cocktails that are in line with his songs. Yeah. And then um, next year, we've got the Queen Bee with Little Kim. Um, and uh, yeah, working on some other stuff, but um, can't reveal that stuff yet. But right. those are the things that are just like right out in the world that uh are coming out in the world so is that the the book with kim how is um how is that being curated are you co-authoring or are you writing it about her oh it's, or... it's, it was um it was a collaborative project between kim and i okay okay mm-hmm. that's gonna be very very interesting i have already placed my pre-order oh yeah so. <laughs> <laughs> um as someone that was born and raised in the Bronx, but I've been living in Brooklyn for 20 years. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So um, I'm definitely, definitely a fan. And as soon as I saw it, I was just like, oh, pre order. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. And then I have Amazon Prime, so I know it's going to come the next day. So yay. <laughs> Sometimes they even do it the day before to ship, so you get a day of, which is nice of them. My heart just jumped like three beats because I'm obsessed. I I, I truly um, like I remember um, when I got the news about about Big and I got the news before anybody else did. So <laughs> my goddaughter's father, who was actually out there with with Puff and mm-hmm. um, and Big and he left a message for my best friend and mm-hmm. on the answer machine. So she calls me hectic and crazy. And I was like, what's going on? Mind you, it's like four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what's, what's happening? So she's like, I, uh, pig, pig is dead. Um, but, but he's okay. And I'm like, what, mm-hmm. what's going on? I didn't believe it. I did not believe it. She, she, it's like she couldn't even talk, but she let me listen to the voice my message, and I was like, "This is not, this is not real. This is not real." So I'm up at five o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, and it's, it was like a Saturday, and I'm watching the news, and I'm like, "Oh, okay, nothing's happening." And then it went across the screen, and I was just like, mind blown. I could not believe it. And it almost became it became real, right? It became okay. real. And I remember I was living at home and my mom came in and she was like, hey, good morning. And I was like, hi. She was like, what happened? I was like, Biggie. She was like, who? And I'm, I'm, my mom is West Indian, so she has no idea who that is. But um, of course she knows now. But it was just, you know, really surreal because I, I listened to, you know, Ready to Die. That was my morning, you know, my morning my morning playlist and I listened to that constantly and it was just like you know I I, I thought back to so you have to listen to the lyrics of, of certain things and you have to listen to the pain the pain that he was going through when writing those songs it resonated so much more after he died because you realize the struggle the internal struggle that he was going through when writing that and then you listen to life after death and you, it's a little more lighthearted and you realize that he was, you know, the battle was kind of financial. It was spiritual. You know, he was going through so much at the time. Um, but him able to provide for his family, which is something that he ultimately wanted to do. It was able to take the weight off. So he didn't have anything to worry about because he was able to do what he needed to do as far as his family, his mom, his kids. And then, you know, his will to live was so much stronger. He didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to end it all. He did not want to not exist anymore because he knew that there was so much more for him, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, you know, you know, God bless big, but you know, it, it sucks. But um, I had a question, but it just went out of my head. My emotions are taking over me. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is, I'm excited for you. I'm really, really excited for you and your journey. And um, you've been rooted in in journalism for a very long time. How long have you been writing? Um, it'll be 
like 23 years next year, about, um, you know, publish, publish. Um, it'll be like 20 years, but like I, cause I, you know, I consider like the earliest days of my journalism were 99 when I was like on the roots boards, writing these think pieces and that were like, you know, or even going to other message boards and kind of just being that like, like my, my time as a writer is about two decades. If you could go back and tell your 16 year old self mm -hmm. something that you learned now, what would you, what would you tell her? 16. Wow. That's 1995. Where was I in 95? Um, you know, this, and this might seem, it might seem a little like generic or maybe not. I would tell her to start earlier and go harder. Mm. Because I spent so many years of uncertainty in those early years of writing that because I didn't quite, I didn't feel I measured up to the people who came before me. Mm -hmm. Still don't, right? And I think that's imposter syndrome, right? Like you don't feel yes, like yes. Right? And it caused, it caused um, a lot of like, delays and and what would I, I guess we could consider like to be progress right mm -hmm. but you know, we didn't move as fast back then right like we didn't move the way like this younger generation moves right like they'll they they take what they want and I and I appreciate that because um especially women or you know those who identify as women um you know uh you take what you want right like like that's you just take it and man and do what you got to do. And I didn't, I didn't have that. I didn't have that uh, mentality in this industry. Right. But um, I also would tell myself back then, you know, to understand the value of a work-life balance when you get older, like nobody teaches you that either. Like you're, you're told that if you work really hard and you develop a thick skin and you dedicate all these hours, the 10,000 hours to, to doing this, that, you'll be exactly where you want to be. And you'll never be exactly where you want to be if you have an ambitious spirit. You always think that you're climbing and climbing and climbing because, you know, obviously idle mind is the devil's playground. So you mm. always kind of going, right? So you get to this age and the concept of a timeout seems ridiculous. You know, you go on vacation just to post it on Instagram. Say <laughs> I'm on vacation. Yeah. You unplug, but not without the announcement that you're unplugging. So it's a little bit, it's, it's weird because that, in that, um, as, as a 16 year old, you know, I'm very like fortunate. And I know you are too. We weren't in social media as teenagers. Imagine if we were teenagers. Oh my God. Media. It would have been we've been working in hip hop, you know, a couple of years later. Like, I don't know what I would have done in like 99 if there was social media. Like, I mean, we had message boards, but I don't know what I would have done if people were tweeting our behaviors or putting it up on Instagram or, or watching yeah. these happen, like all this stuff, like, like how you mentioned with like, even a couple of years prior to that Biggie and Tupac, with the whole like social media that was around, but yeah, I would just say start earlier and go harder, like get it, get it going like early. Like I, I really, I'm, I'm in a very, I'm in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm intergenerational in, in hip hop journalism. Like I sit in between two very important generations. Mm -hmm. Right. And in, in many ways, I'm kind of the lost generation in the sense that um, the people who started with me moved into different roles. Like, like not everybody in my generation of hip hop journalism actually stayed a writer. Right. But some did incredible things like their directors and, you know, they're 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 leading the charge in digital music and all this other stuff. But as someone who was intergenerational, if I just started a couple of years earlier, I would be in the generation that I like feel is like the golden generation of hip hop journalism. So like for me, I, it, it's really just that whole almost famous mentality of like trying to, trying to be part of the Lester Bangs generation, like, you know, wanting to be part of something bigger, but still being, feeling like you're too young, you know? Right, right. So that's what I would tell myself. Start yeah. early. Harder. I don't know. I don't know um, how spiritual you are, um, but I, I believe that there's a timing like the universe mm -hmm. knows exactly when your time is going to come. And I kind of feel like had you gone harder and started sooner, I don't think you would have been on this path that you would 
be on. I think that you are right where you need to be at this point in time. And I think that you have given a voice to the voiceless, um, you know, i.e. Alia, and um, you're telling stories that need to be told in the way that they need to be told. Um, you teaming up with Kim is, is an example of that because I don't think that anybody else, to be quite honest, would be able to tell the story, her story, the way that it needs to be told. And I know that Kim has been through a lot, but reading reading Aliyah's book, mm-hmm. it made me, you know, and when I say I read it three times, I read it three times like I never read it before. I would read it and then stop and then read it and then stop. And I had, there were times where I was a little bit emotional because you were definitely painting a picture and it was almost like watching watching a reality show where I remember where I was when I heard about the plane crash. When I I remember when when you know when she was on Star Search, what I was doing. I have a very vivid memory, and it just brings me back to the good, bad, and indifferent memories of her. And I don't think if anybody else told the story that it would not have touched me in a way like that. It just brings her story to life pun intended because reading it it's kind of like she's not even gone you know what I mean she's still here with us so I I really thank you for that and um if nobody else thanks you I thank you (laughs) at the heart of it I'm I'm you know that I I adore Aaliyah like you know I and I rep her hard like I didn't I wasn't even like planning oh my gosh I didn't even I when I sat down I was like oh gosh do I look like a billboard for like no oh my god I was was like literally just you know grocery shopping and and I just realized when I was like going to sit down that I was like wearing one of my Aliyah shirts you know um so it's just one of those things where it's like I I always rep for her and and um I always hold her in the highest you know because like her name she's the highest most exalted one the best so yeah. it's like um so being able to tell that story and have people read it and feel the love for the subject that's the that's always the goal in my writing you know um it's never to read something and be like well why'd she do this like what was what was the point of talking about that right right um, and, and, and did that it, this project, you know, because I, I adore little Kim. Oh my God. She is, she is an icon who is still killing it. Yes. That's the, that's the thing. This is not some story that you're writing from a past perspective. This is someone who is still out there and has the most consistent career where Kim will still sell out like arenas. Like Kim is, Kim is just, she's dynamic and you don't get many little Kims in, in a lifetime. Nope. So it's, and there's a reason why she was friends with Aliyah, right? Yes, yes, like, I remember that. Yeah, so they, they are one in a million, right? Like that's the, that's the thing. So getting to have, and the thing that was crazy was I was doing Aliyah's book and Kim simultaneously. So it, it was, it was just one of those things where you're writing about two friends, you know, and it, it was, um, it, I'm blessed. Like it was, it was a gift. It was a gift that, um, that I don't take for granted. That's so, um, okay. One last question. What would be your dream project? Like who would be the person that you would love to write about? No restrictions no question just the first person that pops into your head Lauren Hill Lauren Hill oh that's a good one yeah she's got an amazing story too uh like like Miss Hill if you if you're if you're watching <laughs> um let's manifest that chapters in God Save the Queens because I um oh gosh Lauren yeah that like Uh, yeah yeah that's it okay well we're gonna manifest that and we're gonna come back and we're gonna revisit that in maybe a year or five 
And um, wow, yeah. So it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, same here. Speaking with you. I am... I'm, I, I, I was totally fangirling. I was sitting here like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> but um, yeah, you're so down to earth. I really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me today. Thank you. And Thank um, you. we here at the magazine, like we, we appreciate it. Just the whole insight, like you are a wealth of knowledge. So I, I definitely want to thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, 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 it's incredible what you're doing, you know? Oh, thank you. You know, while we're being told all the time that we're giving voices to the voiceless, you're giving voices to us. Like you're letting us talk it out. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's not, that's not always something that we get either. Oh so. my gosh. I appreciate that. Thank you. That means so much. Um, just, just very recently, um, last week, we, we won for literary magazine of the year. I saw that. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Incredible. Incredible. Thank you. And um, it's still a little surreal. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to get emotional. But this is truly a passion project. And to be able to, to speak to people and to give them the voice and the platform to, you know, to, to share their projects and to, and to share everything that's going on with them is the highlight because I am absolutely enamored with literacy I I was I've been writing ever since I was like literally writing since I was like three years old and writing in in what they call cursive since I was four so and and reading and and write like you could if you wanted to punish me tell me to go outside (laughs) right I hated going outside um It's like so I went outside for an hour and and make my parents happy and then I come inside and read the book under the covers with the flashlight. So good, so good. What was your favorite book as a kid? Oh my gosh, Super Fudge. <laughs> I um Nancy Drew. Oh yes, I liked her, but it was I, I I'm a scaredy cat, so I was kind of like I don't know. Well, but Super Fudge, Ramona. Oh yeah, that, that, God. That, not to interrupt you. You asked me about like a dream book. So yeah. um, the author of Nancy Drew is Carolyn Keene, but yeah. that is that's a pen name. So it's multiple authors who are Carolyn and Carolyn Keene. So one of my one of my dreams would be to be Carolyn Keene for one for a Nancy Drew book. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. Carolyn Keene is just um, it's a pseudonym. Like there, there is no Carolyn Keene. Like it's it's a um, it's a yeah. I don't know if there was an actual Carolyn Keene. I don't think there was. But yeah, they kept the name. Like, so if you look up like Nancy Drew, like even in the newer books, yeah, by Carolyn Keene, it's, it's a, it could be a guy. It could be um, wow. all different Carolyn. Spring, stop trying to jump out of my face. It's, um, it's, it's falling out like four times. The universe is like, take it off. Like, we're like, what are you doing? Why are you wearing <laughs> a reality show? Um, so uh, that's funny. That's kind of like um, B.C. Andrews. So after she passed away, I think in the 80s, mm-hmm. her estate decided to keep writing the books. But the tone of it changed a little bit because they have other people writing under that name. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's a lot of authors that hire people. I'm trying to look up who Carolyn Keene, if Carolyn Keene was a person. Um, mm-hmm. I, can never, I, know, I know it's a, a shared pseudonym, but Okay. Carolyn Keene is the pseudonym of the authors of the Nancy Drew Mysteries. Wow. Learn something new every day. See, this is what, this is why reading and literacy is important because I would have never known. Oh, there is a Carol, there was a Carolyn Keene though. Hold on. I guess. Oh, so they're kind of like taking over? I don't know. Nancy Drew Sleuth. Oh, Mildred Wirt Benson, AKA Carolyn Keene. That was, wow. I rest her soul. She passed away in, 2000 something mm. 2002 born in 1901 uh, whoa god bless her mm, long life oh, yeah. yeah wow 97 years old yeah that's amazing oh my gosh oh, I would want to be Carolyn Keene once that's that's awesome I that's well you know who who knows you got to manifest things um I actually 
when we started the magazine almost a year ago, um, we said well, that we wanted to win an award. And Put I'm not going to say it was impossible, but I just kept saying it over and over and over. And it happened. And I'm forever grateful to everyone amazing. that voted for us. Amazing, amazing. And maybe you'll be on the ballot next year. Actually, I want you to be on the ballot next year. Hopefully. We'll pray for that. Well, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with me. Um, I hope you put away your groceries. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I look forward to speaking with you again. We can maybe revisit this and talk about um, what other projects you have coming up. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, and have a, a good rest of your uh, day. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.